Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. Well, a good friend of mine, um, who's a lawyer, uh, put a post that was really intriguing. She said she'd become a CEO of a charity, which is, you know, isn't that what everyone's dream is to become head of a charity? And I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I spoke with her and she said she's not taking a salary, which uh, I think is crazy because she's one of the smartest people I know. Um, and so she's worth every cent uh, that she doesn't get and that she deserves. Uh, and then I wanted to find out a little bit about uh, the charity. And she told me that it is the largest landowner, largest charitable landowner uh, in Ontario. And so that sounds like it's uh, kind of interesting. So I want to introduce you to Saba Ahmed, who is the CEO of a charity called Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy. They protect wildernesses, 23,000 acres of Ontario wilderness, to be precise. She says, we're like Nature Conservancy of Canada, but focused on Ontario, the largest Ontario-focused land trust known mostly for the cup and saucer on Manitoulin Island, but she knows all the great trails. And uh, and she's joined tonight by Ted Cowan, who is the treasurer, and Shannon McDonald, who is a project, is it a project manager that does uh, some of the uh, tours? Is that correct? Oh, I, uh, I, I'm focusing more on land acquisition. So bringing uh, protected areas into our, into our, into our trust. Well, given what uh, Doug Ford is doing with our, uh, with our, uh, what's it called? Green belt. Uh, we need people like you to acquire some of that land and put it into a land trust. So welcome to the show. Uh, Saba, maybe you can start off. Tell us a little bit about uh, what this conservancy is and why the heck are you doing this? <laughs> Well, I've been volunteering for the charity for about 10 years, which is a drop in the bucket compared to several of our board members who've been there since inception, which was 1997. So this charity has been operating for 25 years, and we have steadily been amassing land across the province, particularly along the escarpment. That is a, a ecologically valuable uh, area and uh, recognized by UNESCO as a uh, as a, a preservation site that we really should be focusing on, globally rare sites. And uh, our experts like Shannon can tell you more about that. But uh, for me, I was kind of brought on to be like the lawyer. You know, every charity likes to have a lawyer on the board to help them with issues as they come up, you know, just complimentary and you kind of back off when you uh, really need uh, lawyers. But in my case, I, I had to manage uh, the Harper audits when Stephen Harper came after the environmental charity. So. I ended up learning the charity soup to nuts in the course of that and then stepped back again. And uh, recently when uh, when there was a bit of a vacuum in the leadership, we have bylaws that mention that actually the chair, which I've been for three years, is the CEO. So, um, you know, while we were transitioning to more digital and looking to beef up our uh, staff, um, I decided that basically, you know, I'm going to audit the charity again. Uh, and uh, in my capacity as CEO, and it'll probably just take a few months, and and then we'll make sure that it's uh, properly staffed uh, with people who have uh, all the right tools and resources that they need to keep it going, so that we can keep on doing what we do. And um, you know, Ted is one of those initial founders, and so I I feel a little bit like uh, you know I'm the new kid on the scene. I've only been here ten years, but Ted. Uh, Ted started the darn thing, and um, and he's still here, and uh, and he is uh, uh, just a a real trailblazer. I mean, we acquired Heaven's Gate recently, and that was uh, something that Ted worked really hard on, and he was recognized uh, about two years ago with the June Call. Uh, sorry, it was just last summer actually, the June Callwood Award as uh, a provincial award for the Volunteer of the Year, and and Ted won that last year. Well, congratulations, Ted. That's fantastic. Tell us why you got involved in this charity, sir. Well, the why of it, I'm a resource economist. I, I never wanted to be a land baron. But uh, before conservation, my real estate adventures were for apartments and buying two homes and sort of the first 15 years of family life. Nothing since on the personal side, but within a hundred, I my, have had a small part in about 150 of our 225 plus properties, uh, these transactions. Uh, my first real estate experience was uh, buying a house. The owner was extremely nervous. So at the, towards the end of the transaction, he went down to the basement, came up 
with a very large bundle of weed, put it in the fireplace, lit it, and stuffed his head in after it to relax, <laughs> lost his beard. But we reached an agreement. And the moral of that story, if there is one, is conservation needs agreement too. And agreements need give and take. And on the conservation side, it takes a love of the place and the creatures there and the people who are going to use it. In my case, one of the first places I really fell in love with was Manitoulin. Yep. And that's the setting for the Heaven's Gate and the Cup and Saucer, uh, Michael's Bay, uh, Lake Wolsey, just incredibly beautiful sites, places to visit. Absolutely wonderful. So my first bit of advice to people who are wondering about conservation is go to Manitoulin. You'll fall in love with the place. It's as fine as any other part of Canada. So, so Sab, I've got to the, ask as the lawyer, it's, I've got to ask Sab as the lawyer, if uh, this guy signed it when he was high on weed, is it a legally binding uh, a sales contract? I don't know. Um, Shannon, let's turn to you. Is there evidence that he was high? <laughs> Shannon, let's turn to you. Uh, tell me, um, you're buying this land. How do you buy it? Where do you get the funds from? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the, for the majority of the 25, almost 26 years that the organization has been up and running, uh, we've been really grateful that most of the land that's come to our door has been generously donated by landowners. Um, we haven't had to come up with a large amount of capital um, over that 25 years in order to protect 23,000 acres, That's which a... just demonstrates just demonstrates the the power of conservation and the message that that has for people. Um, but uh, lately, you know, we've been getting a lot of and, support and, from... and 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 how powerful Ted's weed is. But go on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, lately we've been we've been really lucky, and the uh, federal and provincial governments have been um, putting a lot more money into conservation as they've been recognizing the value of of nature services and and the value of protecting this land for future generations. So, and what do you do um, with it? Do you put up uh, plaques? Do you put up tours? Do you put up uh, trails? What do you do with the land once you get it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So. Basically, uh, if there's anything overly significant about the property or something that's very fragile about the ecosystem type, we would protect that um, for nature's sake. However, there's lots of land that is compatible with public with public use. And so we do have a number of trails. Like Saba was mentioning, the Cup and Saucer Trail is one of our most visited, um, one of our most frequented trails, and that one's on Manitoulin Island. It has an adventure trail, so you can go there, you climb the escarpment, and then there's all these ladder features. You can go and really have a great time up there. But then we have some trails closer to Toronto. We have one in Caledon, which is a really accessible trail just in a small neighborhood, um, just north of Toronto. And then we have a trail um, up in Meaford called the Trout Hollow Trail, which was generously donated by a family a local Meaford family. And it also uh, is really cool because there's a lot of historic and cultural significance to that area as well, um, including an old site where John Muir was um, and uh, lots of lots of historic fishing and and botanical things to see there as well. We're having a conversation tonight uh, with uh, three people that are members of the board of a of a charity that frankly I hadn't heard of before called the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy, uh, Saba Ahmed, Ted Cowan, and Shannon McDonald. We're going to take a break for messages and be back into uh, to chat a little bit more about uh, conserving land. Is it smart? Is it good? What happens to it? Where does the money come from? How come I've never heard of this charity before? Et cetera, et cetera. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Second and Sixty. We're chatting tonight, I guess, about uh, conserving land, uh, but also about the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy. 
uh, a friend of mine, Saba Ahmed, announced that she's become the CEO of that organization, which was a little bit of a shock. And so I wanted to find out uh, what was going on. And uh, I've met uh, and you're meeting tonight, Ted Cowan, who is the treasurer of the organization, and Shannon McDonald, who uh, acquires a lot of the property, as well as uh, uh, Saba Ahmed. Uh, the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy uh, protects Ontario wildlife shorelines and wetlands. Um, the Escarpment, Shannon, I thought, I never thought that Manitoulin Island was part of the Escarpment, is it? Yeah, it is in fact part of the escarpment. The escarpment is a very, very large geological feature that extends south of Niagara Falls into, into New York and up through Manitoulin and across down through Michigan and back down through the states again. And so it's quite a, a quite a long feature. Back down through Michigan again. That's fascinating. So this is mm -hmm. this is a, yeah. a, a a part of land that was higher than everything else caused by the ice age. Well, it's a result of unequal erosion, and so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it was formed millions of years ago um, on the on the on the base of the of what was a marine a marine environment. Passing, I never knew that. Ted, what's your favorite place? In, uh, well, in all of your escarpment? The absolute favorite is Heaven's Gate, which uh, I just, I've seen bits of it every year since I was about four or five years old and just feel like it's part of me. Uh, at the very west end in the village of Willisville, Willisville Mountain, the immediate neighboring mountain disappeared starting 1930, and now it's a very large hole in the ground. And the fear was that Willisville Mountain would become a large hole too. Sorry, how does a hole? How does a mountain disappear into a hole? It became a quarry in order to take the quartzite, which is pure silica, gets taken by a train and truck to metal refineries melted and separates types of ore in the refinery and then it becomes part of a slag heap they uh so it goes from a crystal white mountain to a slag heap and it's not a great natural transition but it's essential in the process of getting gold and nickel and iron silver all the hard rock metals and so this very large quarry had been going since 1935. In any event, the mining company wanted some cash. One of their employees tipped off his dad, who was a lawyer who I dealt with earlier in my lifetime. And uh, he called us up wondering whether we could do something to conserve it. I got a glass of lemonade out of it and three years work unpaid. Oh. They, uh, it is an incredible hill all on its own. And the remarkable thing about the negotiations is that the mining company wanted to make sure that we were the right people to adopt and take care of their mountain. And are you? They, I believe we certainly are. And as two weeks after the start of that, other people came to me and asked the three mountains next door, can you conserve them? And I said, I really didn't know. I just started on this other one and it was going to cost about 200,000 in this. Their three mountains were 2000 acres, 10 times the size, 10 times the price. But I did commit that if we could conserve the one, we'd get started on the other. And where is Heaven's Gate, sir? It is immediately next to the west. If you're driving, you leave Sudbury, go west on the Trans-Canada, turn south at Espanola, and you'll go right through it. Yeah, it's and pretty, it's pretty the, uh, But, you know, what you got to think of is that there were these two, Heaven's Gate connects Killarney and La Cloche. So these, are two, right. these are two large protected natural areas. And if that Heaven's Gate piece in the middle 
had been developed, and that would really cut into the wide geographic range that some of these animals so need to roam, like uh, wolves the, or bears. Or, with the park know. to the east and the park to the west, that's 80 kilometers uninterrupted conservation land. And there are not many other places on the continent where that happens on this side of the Rocky Mountains. It's very unusual. It's got 13 rare species that we know about. And there are hopefully some more. Hundreds of not so rare species that are protected. The beautiful thing about it physically, I think people really fall for the place, is it's the place in Ontario where the north meets the south. The limestone plates that we live on here in Toronto, Hamilton, Mississauga, right up to the Bruce Peninsula, that's where they stop going north, is right at the bottom of Heaven's Gate. It's where the plates of the south meet the continental parts of the north. It's where the southern vegetation, the hardwood forest that we're used to here, meet the spruce and conifers. So on Heaven's Gate, the valleys are hardwood and magnificent hardwood, and the sides of the valleys are conifers, black spruce, just the same as you'd see anywhere in the north, and they're there together, and they're creeks, small lakes that are held in there with beaver dams, and some of them completely natural, and you just can't help but see something new every time you open your eyes, whether fungus I have counted 60 different kinds of mushrooms on a two-mile walk. They're all different colors, all different shapes, absolutely fascinating. Boulders just hanging by the side of the trail. you think if some little kid pushed them, you'd be done for. But they've been there for as long as we can imagine. Those rocks are the oldest rocks on the surface of the Earth, three and a half billion years old. And right next door, down across the channel, it's just limestone. And as Shannon points out, it's only a couple million years old, which sounds ancient enough. But Heaven's Gate has seen all five ice ages come and go, and it's still there. I've got to go visit it, but I got to take you, you because I want you have, to come along and be my tour guide. You Fantastic. do have to go. Absolutely, and it, it's a bit of a drive to get there, but you could turn your cell phone off. Parts of the place, you don't have to turn it off. There's no cell connection. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Sabah, tell well, us a little bit about that. Uh, that's <laughs> my story about Heaven's Gate. It was a make, it was, it's a love story. And it absolutely worked out. When we made the offer, the owners dropped the price. It was the first thing they said because they wanted it conserved. Yeah. A few weeks later, a person we'd never heard of left a bequest, a bequest, quite a large one. The first installment was half a million dollars. A few weeks after that, one of our members said he was going to make a lifetime sacrifice of some substance. And he donated half a million. And others, very, very substantial gift, and thousands of gifts between five dollars and two hundred and fifty, three hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty-five seemed to be a very ordinary short of gift, but that's a big deal. That was a week's groceries for some family. That was a big deal. And they did it because they knew the place. And they loved it, wanted it conserved, and it now it like, is. Sounds like a fascinating place, and I do really want to visit it now. Uh, but I do want to yeah, capture I, you I, up and take you and your uh, and your tour guide uh, um, knowledge uh, with me. Saba, tell me a little bit about the history. Uh, I understand that the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy was started in uh, only 1997. So you're only uh, 25 years old. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it was a pretty, uh, um, uh, the land trust community, I, I guess there were some organizations that were uh, conserving land even longer than, than we were in, in the 70s and maybe even before then. But I think um, part of what EBC had going for it was a real a, a real good understanding of sort of the tax uh, benefits of donation and uh, how you can um, sort of uh, leverage a land donation to to meet your objectives when you're planning uh, estate uh uh, you, you know, planning, um, uh, doing your estate planning. So, for example, a, a typical scenario would be that uh, you own a cottage and you love the wilderness around your cottage um, and you imagine that, you know, you're probably never going to sell it and you probably are going to, you know, leave it to your kids, but you don't want them to just cash in. So you might do what's called putting a a, a conservation easement agreement on your land. Um, which means that you would uh, basically put a promise on your land that you're never going to develop it. And that reduces the value of your land and you get a tax receipt equivalent to the diminution in value of the land. So that's called the CEA route. Another thing you could do is sever the land, donate part of it and keep the place with the cottage on it. And then that way you have a nice wilderness area around your cottage and um and yet you know uh, and 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 assurances that it will never be built up so that's another way that we got uh, a lot of donations and 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 this uh this kind of messaging sort of the the more businessy angle is something that i think distinguished us from some of the other charities and allowed us to grow like they you know you were asking shannon and how did you get all this land well you know there were uh, of course, people love the land, they want to conserve, they care about the rare species, they care about the beautiful vistas, um, but they also, you know, can't easily afford to give away land. But if there's a, a policy by the federal government that al allows us to be a charity and allows us to receive these gifts as donations, that really helps. And uh, Environment Canada has a program called the Eco Gift Program that really facilitates people uh, being able to give their land to a land trust. And there's quite a few land trusts in Ontario. Uh, we're just one. And, um, you know, you you probably heard of the Bruce Trail Conservancy. And actually, it used to be the Bruce Trail Association. And some of the founders of EBC were together at um, that organization. So the birth of EBC was almost a split between those two uh, organizations. And, um, you know, yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a ride and, and we're really happy to be part of such a vibrant land trust community. We work with other land trusts to make sure that someone who wants to preserve land, if it's not appropriate for our portfolio, we try to get them to uh, an organization that, that might be able to help them. So, um, yeah, and I, I bet you Shannon could probably even tell you more about the, the tax stuff being a business guy. I know that you'd be interested in that. Go for it, Shannon. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously, uh, just with uh, with any other um, land sale, most people are familiar with uh, with that sort of <clears throat> method of land acquisition. Um, and you know that ensures that the land would be conserved it would, if we purchased it, but it also comes at a cost to the landowner, especially if they're eligible for capital gains tax. And as we're primarily interested in vacant land, these tax implications are usually something the landowners we work with do face. Um, so another pathway to protection comes into play with, as Saba mentioned, um, the eco gift. And so <clears throat> what an eco gift, uh, the eco gift program, which is run through Environment Can and Climate Change Canada, it was created um, with a special provision of the income tax Act, which makes it easier for people to donate their land to conservation. So with a minimum donation of 20% of the fair market value, the landowner receives a charitable tax receipt. And for the, that's for the value of their donated ecological gift, which then can be applied to their net annual taxable income. Um, so corporate donors actually deduct that amount directly, while individuals use the sum to calculate a non-refundable tax credit, which can be used over a 10 year period with no limit on the total value eligible for deduction or credit in any given year. Um, there's obviously certain criteria that must be met in order to qualify for an eco gift. Um, but if these criteria are met, it can make donating land very similar to selling on an after tax basis, which really, which really helps us and the landowner out. Um, and then like Saba was saying, another pathway for conservation is geared towards people who want to continue owning their land, but also want to ensure that it will not be damaged by future development. 
Um, so we've worked with many such people and we use what we call a conservation agreement. Um, and with that, you donate the value of the specified development rights. Um, by the way, restrictions on the land called covenants, um, which govern not only the present owner, but future landowners. Um, these covenants are registered to title and it ensures that anyone who owns the land in the future also are restricted by these covenants. And so <clears throat> as a land trust like EBC can ensure future owners follow the rules that you as a landowner set out to ensure the property you hold so close to your heart remains protected for generations to come. Um, example covenants include no severances, no commercial building, no commercial mining, no removal of forested areas. Um, and then these land development rights, they're appraised independently. So you'd receive, like Saba said, a charitable tax receipt for the value of the development rights donated. And with an eco gift, this is also 100% tax credit and can be used against your income tax for up to 10 years until it's all used up. So if I have a big piece of property up north and it's within yeah. your area of interest and I donate it to you, uh, then I get a tax credit equal to the value of the land that I've donated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, everyone's tax situation is a little bit different. So obviously you have to um, get advice from a, I mean, Understood. I'm not a professional. And if I have this, and if I have <laughs> this large land and I put a, uh, a, a, uh, agreement on it uh, that says no one can ever cut down all the trees, you'll mm -hmm. similarly give me a tax credit equal to the value of that easement that says no trees cut. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's Sounds like it makes a lot of sense. With the added benefit that when you do go to sell your land, especially with the conservation agreement put on it, when you do go to sell your land as an eco gift, you wouldn't have to pay those, um, those capital gains taxes uh, equal to the amount of your donation. Because you've 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 lessened the value of the the property, and so therefore, when you do something with it, there's less value, less gain. Yeah. Because you already gave yeah. some of that gain um, away, took some of that uh, that 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 benefit up front. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and be back uh, with Saba, Shannon, and Ted in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Having an interesting conversation tonight uh, with three members of, uh, of an organization called the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy that I've never heard about before, uh, but it sounds like it's doing really great things. Saba, why have I never heard of your organization before? <laughs> well, you know, we seem to be the kind of organization that has historically done a lot of marketing uh, in person at community fairs up in the areas where we traditionally operate uh, along the escarpment. So they do know of us on Manitoulin Island. Um, and also we mail uh, a lot of things out to our uh, members. So the social media presence has been very diluted. Also, we're very cost conscious. Um, you know, I think it's been a bit of a choice historically uh, that we don't want to look slick because we're really focused on spending every dollar on buying land and, and stretching the, you know, we, we really like bang for your buck um, as a theme. Uh, and so we haven't had slick marketing, but you know, it doesn't cost a lot to have a nice website. You were showing the, the, the website a moment ago. We have a new fabulous volunteer. Uh, his name is uh, James Cook. He's with Rosander, Maine. And he has been helping us with the new logo and with new marketing materials. We've started uh, um, updating the look and uh, and and actually our communications officer, you might know, is Samantha Angel. She ran for uh, city council a couple of years ago. I think you uh, know her. And um, yeah, so we are really doing a lot more to get our name out there. I was just at uh, Science Rendezvous this weekend trying to get the word out to younger people in the city um, at University of Toronto. Um, that's a, a festival where... The doors are open uh, to all the labs. Uh, scientists show the public what they do. So I just sat out there at my booth and told people about escarpment biosphere conservancy. A lot of people didn't even know what the escar escarpment was. So that might be another reason why we're not very popular. Well, I thought the escarpment was down in Niagara. And then taking a look at your map here, I see that uh, most of your 
uh, properties are far from Niagara Falls. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Why don't we just run through some of these properties and why don't uh, each of you uh, take one and tell me a little bit about it if you visited it to it. Uh, Caledon to Cremor, have any of you visited that one? Yeah, so the the Caledon, the Caledon and Cremor area. So basically the Caledon one is that property that I was telling you about that has the trail that's fairly close to Toronto. It's nestled inside of a subdivision. So basically developments happened all around it. And now there's this beautiful trail that the neighborhood can enjoy on a daily basis um, right in the heart of their own community, which is really special. There's a few other trails in that area. Um, I mean, the Caledon to Cremor area is quite large. Um, and so you're going all the way up to Mad River, Glen Cairn area. And there you have uh, a piece of the G Ganaraska Trail that goes through that Mad River property. There's also a trail on that Harvey Nature Reserve, which is quite beautiful, albeit a little bit steep at some points. But uh, the last time I was there, I uh, hung out with a tiny little raccoon who seem different than the city raccoons. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah uh, about the Grimsby bench, that's not Caledon to Creamer, but it is in a different area that's a little bit off where we normally purchase. It's our a very recent acquisition that we got. Um, Shannon, I, I want you to describe it because I don't know these properties. She's on the front lines, buying the land, checking it out, writing out the baseline documentation reports and the environmental sensitivity reports. So she's really the expert about the land itself. So tell them about Grimsby Bench, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. So like you were saying, um, you thought that the Niagara Escarpment only existed down in Niagara, but in fact, we don't really have too many properties down there. But uh, last year um, and this year, we acquired two properties, one, uh, one in Welland, um, just outside of the city of Welland, and another one in Grimsby. And the Grimsby Bench property is really nice. It's a uh, it's not That's on your the, map because it's, it's not, not on the map yet. yet. It's brand new. We just acquired it March first, and we have not yet updated our online map. But we um, have but to build does, a trail uh, on the on the Grimsby one, so we don't really want people to go there just yet. Um, but we will be having a trail building exercise this summer, and we'll probably invite people out there. It's a little. It's a. It's a. It's a, a how much is it? Nine. Nine. How many acres is that Grimsby bench one, Jim? 43. 43. Oh, it's not, it's not that small. So yeah, yeah. but it's uh, again, really accessible location for, for people in the horseshoe. The, the Bruce trail goes right through it at the uh, upland end. And then it's called a bench because uh, if you read your wine labels carefully, there'll be the Beamsville bench and it's an area of the escarpment where it drops off about 50, 100 feet, and then you get an area, oh, about 500, 600 feet across, and then it drops off again. And that bench area is very shallow soil, but very frost-free, unlike the parts up above and down below. It's it's an extra level of protection. So good for wine and fruit. Excellent for wines and tender fruit. And uh, this particular site, right on the Bruce Trail, in the town of Grimsby, on the, uh, I keep getting my sense of direction mixed up there, on the east end of the town of Grimsby. And... Uh, I love the uh, Bruce Peninsula. Can someone tell me a little bit about uh, your sites in Bruce County and the Huron Shore? Oh. Yeah, so I think one of the best one of the best known ones is one that has a actually even a cottage on it. And so we have uh, lease uh, people who lease that cottage. Uh, you can have a timeshare uh, a week a year. We're full right now, so we don't have anyone who can take that. But it says Cape Herd Alvar Bay. So that's a gorgeous uh, property right adjacent to the town of Tobermory, maybe technically even in Tobermory. And um, it's uh, it's quite large, and you, you've got the Alva right there. So those are the the rocky shores that, as the water level goes up and down, you can really um, you can really see the features of the land there, and uh, lots of uh, space to to hike, and um, just a, a gorgeous scenic place. And and you know what? Yeah, there it is. So the 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 map uh, that you were just showing, um, you can see uh, 
the the one with the shoreline there that's where the cottage is and um yeah i've spent time there uh a, a few times a lot of times we get people to to fall in love with the properties when they actually stay at one of our cottages for a while and um do you have yeah. several cottages we do the, the ones that are um that that uh are, are rentable um are full right so we've got all the time shareholders now so it's it's i mean we we might have a few days here and there for people who are donors and and friends to the organization that we want to um to see like maybe you can come up to Freer Point this summer and Ted and I can give you a tour uh Freer Point is on Manitoulin Island and uh, I bought a timeshare there uh, a couple of years ago and uh, we go to Manitoulin Island every every summer now my family for a week and um yeah it's uh that's that's one of my favorite uh places to stay and um uh, right on uh, Manitoulin Island. If you want to see uh, my favorite uh, preserve, you know, honestly, I haven't been out to very many of them. Like I am a lawyer, right? So I, I, you know, I, I try to help in that. Like I, I did redo the the conservation easement agreement language recently. Like you know, this is sort of the expertise that I bring. Um, everyone has uh, a, a different uh, skill set that we're drawing on, and 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 for me, you know, I, I do have a biology degree, and I do really love nature but uh, i don't think that's my my value added but i do love michael's bay and uh i think um ted had mentioned that one earlier that's on the southern shore of um of manitoulin island and honestly in my opinion that is the most beautiful beach in all of canada and it's like south beach in august only because it is wavy and lake water and sandy and soft and warm, which I have not really experienced all of those qualities together at any beach in Canada before. Like, you know, usually you get like, it's warm, but it's really shallow, like Wasaga Beach or something like, you know, so, and, and then you do see on the Huron shore, some nice beaches, but Michael's Bay is something else. Like it, it just, um, it, it has a really rich history and, and um, it's, uh, it's in Wee Quemacong uh, uh, territory, traditional territory. And uh, we're going to be learning more about its indigenous uh heritage uh, next month when I go up to Manitoulin Island for a for a conference that we'll do you have. do do you do much from an indigenous uh, uh standpoint uh either in promotion of uh of indigenous lands or preservation of indigenous lands or anything like that well we're still still learning how um but we did uh take notice of the truth and reconciliation report of 2015 and the board passed a motion that we were going to uh, try to adhere to those recommendations and implement uh, the policies that were outlined actually in this report by Innes and Attridge. It's about um, a reconciliation oriented land, land trusts and what practices that you can follow. So we are learning and um, actually Shannon made this really great map. I think I have it here. I do. So she created, I mean, it was a, it was a group effort. We have an indigenous committee that um you know when you want to buy a property it kind of makes sense to know whose land it is um traditionally and what interests they have so this is manitoulin island and there are um many nations on the island well there's like five or six that have uh interest in these so right over here this is weak Wemekong territory and michael's bay is right on the southern shore somewhere around here and when we bought it, I, I personally didn't know that that was considered the traditional ter territory of the Wequemekong. I wasn't, you know, there's a lot of other nations around like the AOK up here and over here, Shoshibwaning and Zabasaneng. So, you know, you don't know which one, who claims what. Um, and I, I mean, this is just a work in progress. We don't actually know that these boundaries that, that have been depicted um, would be accepted by all of those nations, but it's our understanding they're roughly correct. Um, and uh, we have a conference going, uh, we're going to be uh, um, attending in uh, on June 13th, we have a meeting with Nevin, uh, which is um, an organization called Niagara Escarpment Biosphere Network, which is, uh, oh, I'm getting a little bit in the weeds, but it's, uh, the purpose of the meeting is reconciliation, and we've been inviting uh, First Nations to come uh, meet with us and talk to us about things like naming uh, the, the the preserves, um, what kind of signage or, or acknowledgements they would want, and also co-stewarding. And, um, you know, we haven't really gotten into discussions about land back and what that would look like. 
um, or co-ownership or, um, relationships and things like that. And I think that there are legal issues that need to sort of be thought about and strategized around um, before you can really embark on it. But the first step is really listening. And, and we haven't really done enough of that. So I don't think we have done enough listening and we haven't done enough uh, touring and walking around. And I think Ted has uh, encouraged all of us tonight to do a little bit more touring and walking around. We're going to take a final break and come back in just two minutes with Ted, Saba and Shannon talking about the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy. Stay with us, everybody. Back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm uh, being very intrigued tonight listening to uh, uh, Ted, Saba, and Shannon talk about the Niagara, sorry, not the Niagara, the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy, uh, an organization that uh, is a land trust and is one of the largest land trusts in all of Ontario uh, and is trying to protect land on the escarpment. Um, I I called it incorrectly, the Niagara Escarpment. I apologize. That's my Freudian slip because that's what I've thought the name was and uh and shannon's corrected me and tell me that this escarpment goes all the way down into uh the u.s all the way up to manitoulin and then back down again into Mis and michigan i got to figure out how that all happens that's really quite interesting ted i got to tell you that my father uh was a camper was a hiker uh was a real uh outdoors guy and uh, spent a lot of time in uh in in the canadian shield up north etc and uh, when he passed away um before he passed away he wanted to be membered by donations to uh, the uh, Trans Canada Trail because um, he loved hiking the Trans Canada Trail and getting to know uh, that. Um, what does donating land or donating to your organization or other trust organizations mean to you, sir? Okay, I think it's a real sense of permanence and. They, it's uh, you get an idea of how long something lasts when you buy your first car and you drive out of a lot, and the depreciation is 30 percent in that first hundred meters. And after that, you get maintenance bills and so on, and then you get to buy your next car. The land is one thing that can outlast us by a great deal. Heaven's Gate again. The Trans-Canada Trail goes through there. So your father's contribution helped build some of the trail in that area. They were maintaining that. There's a memorial that we're just finishing up there now. Uh, it's a large post in the ground. And people who've been part of the process just at no cost to themselves. They just let us know that there's somebody they'd like to have that family member or friend or teacher, whomever it might be, that the name on a leaf, a maple, uh, a metal maple leaf that will go on the posts. And we've got about 130 such names right now. And that's going to last. People are going to go and just look up and Jerry or well, uh, uh, an Elva who showed up today to get a name made. And uh, there are Native people with names there. They're all over the place. And it's brought together in what I think of as the oldest, most permanent part of Canada, and it's going to last. That's what conservation is about endurance going the distance keeping at it it's why we want shannon here because although i might have a 45 year head start on her uh, I, I hope that she's going to finish about 50 years later so and shannon is uh conservation important to young people and why Oh, well, you know what? I'd say conservation is important to young people. I think uh, I think young people um, have been growing up, uh, especially these days with uh, object and like everything is disposable these days. Uh, people don't know what uh, sustainable manufacturing is and people don't understand what long lasting items are. 
And I think that conservation, like Ted said, does offer this sense of permanence and this sense of sort of hope for the future um, that offers more than just uh, something that you're going to have to buy again in a week's time. It offers um, a break from all of that. And I think that's really important. Saba, why would a successful lawyer want to spend time on a charity like this? Because it's important. I mean, I uh, when I left Bay Street uh, on Wall Street, you know, I, I, I started out in law school thinking that I would acquire those skills so that I could be an environmentalist. Like that was my ultimate game plan. And, uh, you know, then you have bills to pay. So you work at these big firms and you make money and it's great. And uh, when I started my own firm about, um, it was coincident with this, so 11, 12 years ago, something like that, I had this idea that I was going to um, uh, be an environmental lawyer. So I started doing some Aboriginal or Indigenous type work and was trying to find a way to be a progressive lawyer. And there, there wasn't really a way. It was either you're working for money or you're working for free. And, you know, it's like either you're helping people who have disputes about money, which gives you a lot of tools. And I was able to use those tools to help EBC deal with CRA. I, I've sued a guy once who chopped down a bunch of trees in breach of a covenant. I've, you know, uh, brought an application to take a caution off title. I've done all kinds of done a cease and desist letter. I've done a lot of in-house type work for EBC. Um, so, you know, that's uh, a lot of meaning. and. Um, and that is, uh, you know, makes makes it worth having these skills, because if you're not using your skills to make the world a better place, then what's the point? Like that that's uh, when I was out in front of U of T handing out flyers, I was like, oh, my God, this is just like being 18, because that's what I was doing when I was 18. I was talking to people about the importance of the trees i started the rainforest club when i was 15 in high school because that's what i wanted to do so this is kind of um you know what what i want to achieve as my own you know kind of, i think we should all be trying to leave the world in a better condition than we found it well my and, favorite uh my favorite author said something like uh if someone like you doesn't care a whole awful lot nothing is going to get better it's not um, Shannon, if people want to uh, consider donating, I, I showed the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy website where they can check out uh, uh, your different uh, uh, um, properties and, uh, and and places to visit. But if people want to consider donating, is there a website they can go to? Uh, I presume it's you that they talk to. What do they do? Yeah, sure. Uh, they can uh, either email me directly by finding me on our team on our team page on the website, or you, there's a form where you can fill out uh, to contact us right on the website. So uh, that information will all get my way. Well, or I got to give you one recommendation. E <laughs> I, you can send an e-transfer to finance at escarpment.ca. <laughs> will get your money. It'll go right into our bank account. You can also go on the website where it says uh, donate and click that button and uh, and we'll get it. And, and uh, we also just want people to sign up for the newsletter. And uh, there are buttons right on the front of the of the website to tell you how to do that, especially students and Indigenous people. It's free to become a member. And uh, really important that we engage with people who hadn't heard of us before now. We we want you to know about us. Well, I got to tell you what you need to do. You need to bottle up uh, uh, Ted Ted Cowan's uh, uh, comment, comment, commentary about uh, some of your properties, particularly uh, Heaven's Gate, and uh, and put it on a little uh, DVD or or podcast or something like that, uh, and allow it to go along with you uh, on your on your tour. And I am for sure going to put uh, Heaven's Gate as one of uh, the things I got to do this summer. So thank you very much, uh, Ted and Saba and Shannon from the Escarpment Biosphere Conservancy, telling us a little bit about uh, this uh, this charity that I wasn't aware of and the importance of land trusts and the importance of uh, con uh, conservation. And as Ted, I think, very eloquently said, um, permanence, establishing something that is that is permanent. And I love that. Good night, everybody. That's our show. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You.